college football. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. My name is JT Wister, so former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about a basketball player maybe transferring to the Utes, to the running Utes. We'll also talk about a tight end who could be committing. He's going to be visiting the program this Friday, June 2nd, actually. So we're going to talk about all that in a bit. But first, let's let's talk about something else, shall we? This was something I was I didn't go into today thinking I was going to be talking about if Utah is in danger of missing out the future of college football but after looking through the comments of my video yesterday and even some of my past one there seems to be a lot of people who think that utah is going to end up back in the mountain west i, I was oh i was so close to naming this video um is utah in danger of going back to the mountain west but it's just it's too ridiculous for me to do that honestly so um i'm just gonna say is utah in danger of missing out on the future of college football no they're not they're in a great position right now, and I'm going to explain why. First of all, I'm not the only one who feels this way, right? Because it could be one thing if I came up here and I gave some take and I was the only one who felt like Utah was in danger of missing out on the future of college football. Those of you who listen to this show uh, recently or just in general know that I am someone who thinks that we are heading for two super conferences, and I think it's going to be some variation of a lot of Big Ten and SEC teams and more than likely all the teams that are currently sit in there. So as I said, I think it's going to start with those bases, and then it'll expand and include a bunch of other teams. So. I'm not the only one, too, who's kind of looked at it and said, like, oh, so what would that kind of look like, like projecting if Utah would be in there? So here are some of the major sites that have projected um, super conferences, Sports Illustrated, Bleacher Report, Fan Slide, USA Today, Sporting News, and Owner's Box, all of them. And I literally just typed in um, college football super conferences. You guys can find and look at these same lists that I just found off a quick little Google search. Every single one of those that I just named had Utah as a projected team into that. Now, I wonder why that is. And let's dive into that a little deeper, shall we? What is the number one reason that we're seeing conference realignment in general, in general, right? And what is the driving factor behind it? It's not competitiveness at the end of the day, because I would argue that Texas, Oklahoma and UCLA and USC, their best chance to win is by staying in their respective conferences, of course, especially with the way the college football playoff com committee is changing things, right? Like we're going to 12 teams on Matic bids by winning your conference. So that's going to be a big thing that's going to come in a part of it. So if if your number one priority is to win, right, you would stay in the conference that gives you the best chance to win too and still gives you a good schedule, right? Like we're not talking about these teams jumping down to lesser conferences. So, oh, look at that. They're the best group of five teams. So now they're in this position I'm talking about. They were perfectly fine where they were in terms of trying to win. So why'd they make the move? Money <laughs> drives everything right in the world. And unfortunately, in the world of college sports now, we've seen NIL have a huge effect on this college football and college sports in general have completely changed with the way not just conference realignment now, but NIL and everything. It's a totally new world. And it's obviously affected this conference realignment talk. It's the reason we're in this position, right? Those schools left for the Big Ten and the SEC because they believe it gives them the best opportunity to make money and also sets them up for the future. And guess what? They were right. Look at the position the Pac-12 is in right now, where we have to constantly talk about rumors about those schools going to the Big 12 or, in the case of Oregon and Washington, going to the Big Ten because they're not in as strong a position. But you know who else isn't as, as strong of a position? The Big 12, after losing those teams. Even the ACC feels like they've fallen behind a little bit. It was the ACC, the Pac-12, and the Big Ten who were in that agreement, right? We're not going to take each other's schools. We're going to stay together. We saw what Oklahoma and Texas did. We don't want that to happen to any of our schools just for, for the Big Ten to stab the Pac-12 in the back and the ACC in regards to the alignment, basically, and be like, nope, we're going to bring two schools over here. So that's how it's changed in general. But as I said, what's the number one moneymaker in college sports? Football. Who has a very good football program right now? Like, really good. Utah football, back-to-back -back conference championships. Over the last four full seasons of college football, I'm excluding the COVID season because they only played five games. In the Pac-12, there were different conferences. It was a mess. So I'm excluding the COVID season. But the last four full seasons, Utah has won 40 games. They're one of the only schools who has won 40 games. They've won nine games, then two 10-win seasons, then an 11-win season in there, too. So they have won a lot, basically. They're, not a lot of programs have won over 40 games, too. And what are the most highly rated games each season? Yes, there are the rivalries. Ohio State, Michigan, no matter how good or bad those teams are, those are going to always sell. But in general, it's still when the best teams play each other, right? 
and Utah has been an opportunity to do that. We I look back at the Oregon Utah game, not just from this year, but the year before. It's always amongst one of the best games uh, this coming season. How good is the story? And the other thing that sells college football is storylines, right? Like Utah taking on USC is going to be great. I think it's going to be a really highly touted game. I think we're going to see some of the top crews in college football at that game, following up the Pac-12 championship, the first meeting in the regular season last year, all the success Cam Rising's had against them. So that is one of the big things, right? Like big games, storylines, teams, that's what sells, right, in college football. It's the reason that the Big Ten and SEC have been so successful, right? They have the top programs, the one who, ones who continue to win and be up there. So people want to go watch and support those teams and programs is because they keep winning, and people like to follow and watch who the best is. And who's been the best in the Pac-12 the last two years? It's been Utah as we said, back-to-back conference champions. So I just have a hard time believing that the super conferences or the other thing I'll say this is too, like I don't buy this notion that Utah's invitation to the Big 12 is going to be revoked if something crazy were to happen. Like let's say even four years from now that um, Utah get for some reason got left out of the college football super conferences. Once again, not what me or any of those sites think is going to happen. And the Big 12 still wanted to have some version of itself because they had some schools get left out too. They would quickly invite Utah into that. Utah's not falling back down in the Mountain West. They're too prominent of a football program. They would be wanted. And once again, I would be stunned if they weren't wanted by one of the major super conferences because they are great at the number. They have been great over the past couple seasons at the number one moneymaker in college sports, college football. It's why all these teams are moving, as we said. So I just don't see like it's not going to get pulled to me. It's as I said, they're interested in winning. Um, and also is Utah to blame for the position the Pac-12 is in right now? Like they have done their job over the past few seasons. You know, I would honestly, I mean, we can all pile on Larry Scott, right? But like who else is to blame for the position that the Pac-12 is in? I think two of the biggest culprits are the two that just left USC and UCLA. I think it would have been great for the Pac-12 if sometime in the college football era, the Trojans or the Bruins had once made the college football playoff. The two of the teams that are established as the biggest brands, right? Especially USC. USC is the one where I'm like, they really put this conference in a bad position by not being more of a powerhouse and a threat to win a national championship, not even making it there. Texas hasn't made it there. Every time Oklahoma made it there with their incredible offense, they got absolutely stomped. So they just didn't help the footprint of those conferences either by the best representative from those conferences was getting smoked by the SEC and the Big Ten's best team, basically. That was something that really hurt. We, they could have used something like um, the Big 12 could have used something like what TCU just did to Michigan a long time ago, and we just haven't had that be the case, right? Like, And it's been so long, obviously, since Oregon made the first college football playoff. So every year you get the SEC and the Big Ten who are perceived as the two best conferences, right? What do they do? They go out there and prove it by beating down on those other conferences. So it hurts the perception because when you think of the best in college football, the best being the team you want to tune in the first, who's going to win the championship, because that's what all this is for is who's going to win the national championship. People are going to be tuning in and watching the SEC and the Big Ten because time and time again, they beat up on those Pac-12 schools. And as I mentioned, I just feel like, look, does Utah blame deserve a little blame. I mean, sure. Like what they lost the Florida game last year. That wasn't great for the Utah brand or the PAC 12 brand in general, but I mean, Utah obviously under the season is a better team than Florida. And I would be very surprised just based on the position this Florida Gators program is in. If Florida came out to rice Eccles and handed Utah their first home loss since 2018, like I just don't see that happening. So once again, I just don't feel like Utah is the one to blame for the PAC 12 being in the state it is right now. So I really do believe Utah will be involved in the future of college football because they make money with football. And that is what this is about, right? That is what college football has become a business. They are top 20 in wins by FBS teams over the last 10 years too. So even if they don't have an offer to join one of the super conferences, once again, extremely unlikely. I think they're going to have that offer, but in some reason they didn't. Whatever's left in the Big 12 would obviously want them in four years or whatever. Utah is going to be around there, going to stay in either more than likely going to a super conferences or whatever is the highest version of that outside of a super conference. And once again, I just, I, I don't even like saying like, well, if they were left out of super conference, because I just don't see them being left out of a super conference, not at the level they're competing at right now. I don't see that changing, even with a coaching change after coach wit. I feel like this programs in a stable position with the recruiting talent they're bringing in to keep it churning. I think they recruit the right type of players. They're getting higher recruits right now. I just, once again, I think they're in an exceptional position, so I don't see why that would change. So I, I really feel good about the position this Utah football program is in and thus the position that Utah athletics is in, because I feel like they're going to be involved in the future of college sports because their best sport is also what happens to be all the other like highest revenue generating teams their best sport as well. So I do believe Utah is going to be wanted in the future of college football. And I think all the talk, the talk of them going to the mountain West and just falling back down is a lot of hype generated by fans and people who frankly don't really know what they're talking about. Right. I mean, look, there's a lot of information out there and thing. And once again, like, am I supposed to believe 
every random person who tells me that Utah is going to be left behind, or am I going to take more note of all of those major sites I listed? Once again, one more time, Sports Illustrated, Bleacher Report, Fan Slide, USA Today, Sporting News, Owners Box, who have all done their research and included all these teams on there, and then are like, yeah, Utah is going to be in the future of the college football. I'm going to trust them rather than the random person I see commenting under a poster on Twitter and something like that saying that, no, Utah is going to get left behind. So there you go. Quick little rant for to open the show today. So once again, Utah is not in danger of missing out on the future of college football to me. And one of the exciting things that Utah is going on right now, and it's one of the reasons they're not in danger of missing all, uh, out on it, is because of the level they're recruiting at. They're having a three-star tight end come up for a visit. We're going to tell you a little bit more about him in a second. But first, I want to talk to you guys about our friends at Bill Bars. Looking for a delicious snack, but don't want all the sugar and calories, then you need the best tasting protein bar ever built. You got to try this. If you're like me and you want to make healthier snack choices, but you don't want to compromise on taste, then I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars and Built Puffs. Built Bars are healthy and taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so amazing, you won't think that they're good for you, but you got to try this. What makes Built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're all covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievably great flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing back rows and what's even better is they are healthy only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein and now you don't need to wait to get your box for years we've been talking about ordering at built bars at built.com which you can still do but you can also head over to your local smith's or sam's club to pick up your box of built bars today so once again built.com or your local smith's or sam's club carrying some delicious and healthy built bars so make sure you guys head over to any of those locations and get some built bars today all righty Moving off of the future of Utah football, as I said, in terms of what conference and all that they'll be playing in, because as I said, it will be a super conference or at least the very next thing below it, whatever that looks like. So Utah football is going to be fine in the future, obviously, and it's going to be in a super conference. I strongly believe again, let's move on. So three-star tight end Decker DeGraff, a tight end out of California who played in just five games last year due to a weird transfer rule out there, but he still caught 23 passes for 378 yards and five touchdowns. Those sound very much like Brant Keithy, right? Like numbers, right? Obviously, I'm not saying this dude's going to be Brant Keithy, but I'm saying look at Brant Keithy's production last year, just the limited amount of games he played in. You can tell he's a special player. In fact, I think by the time the season is over and we're going to dive into why I think this is in a second, DeGraff is going to end up as a four-star prospect. I just think he's that talented. You're talking about a guy who can win lining up inside, outside, anywhere on the field against the corners, linebackers, safeties, like whoever comes down and cover. He's a mismatch nightmare, right? When you're, you're talking about a guy, too, in DeGraff who has all the intangibles to be great. I mean, 6'4", 230, really strong athlete. As I mentioned, an elite tight end. He's wanted by Arkansas, Michigan State, Utah, and Washington. In fact, the whole reason I'm talking about DeGraff before I dive into more about all the things I really like about him is um, he has locked in an official visit. He's going to go to Utah June 2nd, then Arkansas June 9th, then Michigan State June 16th, and then Washington June 23rd. That sounds like a fun month getting to go to all those schools. So on yesterday's show, I really talked about it. Utah was in the running um, for an elite receiver, and he's going to be coming to visit on August 31st. That is to me, like, I would much rather have an athlete come out, and hopefully, uh, DeGraff is doing the summer one early, and then he'll be able to come back later. I love having guys up to game day atmospheres because you go to a school because of the opportunity to play in those games, right? To get developed, all the other things are great too, but you're going to the school for the ga- for game day to be able to perform and show out, and you want to do that in a great atmosphere. And we know that's what Rice Eccles Stadium provides, so I do wish he was coming up for a game, but in terms of since he's just doing all these June visits. I think it's best to either be first or last in these things. And I'll take being first. I think if you're last, you leave the final impression on a guy. So that's what Washington has on June 23rd. But I do like that Utah kind of sets the standard right off the bat. Like, boom, this is where Utah is um, on June 2nd. They're going to bring him in for a visit. They're going to set where the bar is at. And then all the other schools have to live up to that. And look, maybe some of the schools like Arkansas, Michigan State, even Washington can offer some things that Utah can't. But I think the one thing that Utah definitely has an edge up on is just how they use tight ends. I mean, that's something where if you're any young tight end recruit you're watch you've watched Brent Keithy ball out you just watched Dalton Kincaid especially against the USC and you're like man I can imagine and you can easily picture yourself especially once you talk to the coaches Fred Whittingham Jr. one of the best tight end coaches Andy Ludwig one of the best offensive coordinators Kyle Whittingham one of the best head coaches like you can just picture yourself in that system being the next Dalton Kincaid right if you're a recruit talking yourself into playing into a system that you want to be that guy especially be a tight end with this team so that's where I think to graph the Utah makes a lot of sense and why he would be interested in it and I like being able to leave that first impression once again, especially schematically how he could be used. And when you just look at the numbers of how Utah uses their tight ends, Utah tight ends have obviously been more productive than Arkansas, Michigan State, and Washington tight ends, at least of recently. And I do believe we're going to continue just because of the tight end talent they get. And 
I mean, barring another injury or anything crazy, like do we not expect Brand Keithy to dominate this year and be one of the top? And he, I mean, he could easily leave college football and receiving yards amongst tight ends, right? It's going to be him and Brock Bowers battling and out, and it's going to be fun to see who ends up winning that battle. But that's once again, I just think that Utah is a great place for tight end. And if you are an elite tight end, I mean, outside of Georgia, just because Georgia gives you a chance to win you national championships, which you can't do at Utah right now, obviously, like why wouldn't you want to come to Utah? But that's just me talking. Let's talk a little bit more about DeGraff and what he brings. Um, he can win lining up inside or outside, as I said. Um, he's a great athlete. I mean, I just watched his very first play. I watched for him on huddle as him uh, running up the field, getting in the red zone. Safety's coming over, so basically ends up with two guys covering him. He leaps up, uh, makes a difficult one-handed grab, basically, and he so many times makes contested catches, all these different things amongst traffic, has elite concentration, strong, big hands too, large catch radius, can bring in the ball when defensive backs are colliding with him, isn't scared of contact to, like I said, tough bit physical i like the size that ability to leap is something that's really cool i mean thomas yasman how about his hurdle he had last year like the graph is the kind of guy with that kind of athletic potential to me to get to once you get him in the weight room and be able to improve on some of those things um he's also exceptional concentration concentration he can make plays at every field level especially over the middle of the field we know it's where dalton feasted last year i think the graph would feast in this offense over the middle of the field he runs pretty good routes to able to create separation and he's good after the catch, too. He can break out of some tackles. He runs hard, but he's also a little shifty for his size, too. So count me in as a huge fan of Decker to Graf's game. I think he would be a nice addition to this tight end room. I would love to see how he grows, too. And this is another guy, right? We talked about Isaac Wilson, like, wanting to recruit and bring in more of his guys. So, like, you just talk about, like, pairing him with the Mikey Matthews, um, some of the other receivers Utah is talking with, and then getting him to Graf as well. Like, this could be the makings if you land all these guys or just a couple of these elite guys of like a special Utah offense in the future where you've got Wilson distributing the ball to all these talented playmakers, we know Utah is going to have great running backs. They always are able to do that. So I, I really like the way that Utah is recruiting right now. I think the graph, it makes a lot of sense for him to want to come to Utah. I think it's good that Utah gets the first visit to make the first impression, especially schematically. And DeGraff has actually spoken to Utah um, about Utah a little bit as well in a piece put out by Greg Biggins, who's the one who broke that he had these official visits scheduled. And once again, DeGraff right now, just a three-star tight end, but I really think they got a really good chance of that changing in general. And he actually said, um, a, this is a direct quote from the article put out by Greg Biggins. You can find this on 24 seven sports as well. And he was just talking about how, um, Utah is a great program. They use their tight ends very well. This is all coming from DeGraff and the story. It's a focal point of their offense and the stats don't lie. The tight end position at over a hundred catches last year. I really enjoyed my first, um, I, my first visit out there and I really like coach Fred Whittingham and I feel comfortable talking to him and the rest of the staff. So once again, just think it's great that Utah's getting him back out here, opportunity to talk him over, talk more about the schematics and stuff. And if all goes well. I think they got a great chance to land a graph. And I think this would be a good get. Cause once again, I think now that the transfer rules and all that are out of the way, Thinks the guy's going to explode in his senior season and going to get a lot of offers. And a lot of those other schools may be appealing, but you might want to go to a place that gives him a great atmosphere to play at, like we talked about with those game day atmospheres, and it's going to allow him to produce and set himself up for future NFL success. Utah could very easily be the best of that for his skills, depending on who offers him. So I like the position that Utah is in with the graph, and I'm excited to see how the visit goes. I mean, with the last guy we talked about, as I mentioned, that's all the way off until August 31st. This one's coming up June 2nd. So who knows? Um, it'll be fun to see what DeGraff coming into town, see what the team does to him and um, does with him. And yeah, hopefully, like I said, the coaches can pitch him on a vision and hopefully soon he's uh, throwing up the U inside Rice Eccles Stadium making plays. So it's going to be fun and interesting to see. And look, we just talked about the football team, the level of success they're recruiting at, the level they're playing at is going to have a great opportunity for them to land in a future super conference. And the final thing that I want to touch on is another program that wants to achieve that type of success that the Utah football program is currently achieving right now. And that is the Utah men's basketball program who got off to a great start last season, um, or up and down start, I should say, but then the Arizona middle, like December and January were a lot of fun with the steam, right? Like is what they were able to accomplish in those months. Then, Injuries, things came crashing down in February, but still a lot of potential of what could be. They've added a couple of really fun transfers as of late, and they're talking with another one. Toledo transfer, Ray J. Daniels, worked out for um, – he, he, he worked out for the Celtics and will work out for the Bucks May 30th. So Adam Zagora tweeted this out. He's a basketball insider and contributor for New York Sports, Forbes Sports, and NJ.com. Um, once again, he's the one who tweeted this out. He's being courted by Utah, Michigan, and Illinois, and – this is a Toledo transfer, as I mentioned. He also has workouts with the Celtics and the Bucks. But just because you have those workouts doesn't mean you're going pro. Once again, I don't think he's de he hasn't declared, hired an agent, so he's a guy that's still thinking about weighing his college options. Right? I mentioned being courted by Utah, Michigan, and Illinois. And this is a guy who, in the MAC last season, had 19.6 points, 5.8 rebounds, um, 
5.8 assists, excuse me, 4.3 rounds, 1.5 steals a season, and he led the Mac in total points and assists. Just an exceptionally talented guard. So a guy who, look, I know the Mac, obviously it's a, a jump up to Pac-12 competition, but he dominated the Mac, as we said, just led in total points, assists, and he's a guy who has interest from NBA teams and the Celtics and the Bucks too. So that's where, to me, it's just really exciting when you're talking about Ray J. Daniels, what he could be. And I think it's great that other programs like Michigan and Illinois are very much interested in him. And I think Utah could offer him a chance those other programs programs haven't and that's the opportunity to, to play and potentially start right away look I, I really enjoy like Davion Smith's game but I just don't think he has the scoring ability that a guy like Ray J Daniels does I really think Ray J Daniels could come in and potentially lead this team in scoring next year now if Brandon Carlson comes back I'll change that a little bit obviously because that's still up in the air he hasn't hired an Asian or officially declared just going through the process right now and feeling out and figure out what he wants to do but when we talk about Den, um, Ray J Dennis's game I believe I said Daniels a few times so I apologize for that Ray J Dennis's game. You talk about a guy who's a quick athlete. He can push the pace and transition. Um, just so crafty in the half court. Like there's so many things like can spin past guys. Um, just a little hesitation move. So quick with the ball in his hands, crafty finishes well around the basket. That's something that Utah has been missing for their guards. Um, recently, uh, nice handle. Like I said, um, doesn't, settle and can knock down fadeaways post up guys to a little post up some of those smaller guards to put himself in a good position good burst going to the basket the speed and athleticism it's just something they haven't had at the guard position and it's what you need to be successful in the pac-12 um excuse me not just the pac-12 college basketball we saw some of the best centers in the country oscar to zach Eady, uh hunter dickinson didn't he make the tournament uh baycott didn't make the tournament like these are some of the best centers in college basketball and they're an, and yes, basketball team game, but once again, like you, it can be affected because there's just five guys on the court. You can't have dominant individuals affect it, but we're seeing the guards are the ones who have the more success, especially come tournament time. So that's why I really think Utah just needs to get quicker in general. And obviously first Utah just needs to get back to being a really good basketball program before they can even look at the tournament and all those things too. But um, he's so really just really effective inside the three point line, but can also, he can step into threes. He can knock them down off the dribble, create his own shot. Just got a good feel for the game overall. In fact, when you talk about Ray J Dennis too, he is a guy who's kind of stepped up his game each season overall, especially look at his like three point percentage, his freshman season, 26%, then 29%, then 32 and now 36% last season. And he's looking to use the COVID opportunity this coming season too. And look, he started out at Boise state, then was at Toledo the last two seasons and only averaged 12 points a game two seasons ago. And then last year, that 19.5. So also have 1.5 steals a game too. So just that ability to get out and transition as well. And I would love to see him poke the ball away and throw it ahead to Davion Smith for a transition dunk. I just think that's something that would be, excuse me, a lot of fun to see. And it's going to be interesting to see if Utah can land this guy. There is some stiff competition, but he is a really talented point guard. He would, man, raise the, break the roof off. So the Huntsman, I feel like with some of the plays and the performances he could see, we haven't seen a Utah guy, and you guys can roast me in the comments if I'm wrong on this, but I'm just trying to remember the last time we saw a Utah guy like put up just that special like uh, 30 point performance that has like that we're like man, look at him carrying the team like making tough shot after tough shot. I just I can't remember that as of recently. Like we've seen some. I, I remember Alfonso Plummer had that crazy performance against Oregon State in the Pac-12 tournament, but I would love to see it at the Huntsman. And I think Ray J. Dennis is a guy who can do that once again. A really explosive athletic guard from Toledo, crafted with the ball in his hands, an exceptional scorer, professional scorer, as people like to say, can knock it down from inside the arc and outside the arc too. Threat from mid range, three level scorer. I really like Jay, Ray J. Dennis's game and uh, really hope the running youths are able to land him. But it's going to be interesting to monitor and see how it all plays out. So that's going to do it for today's initial lockdown youths. We appreciate all of you for joining us as always. KSL Sports' is Michelle Bodkin is going to be joining us tomorrow to talk about a little bit about Utah softball and what they have coming up in the Women's College World Series. And of course, more matters pertaining to the Utah football program. That'll be on tomorrow's lockdown youths. We'll see you then.